there's a lot of talk about quercetin right now. Quercetin is a powerful flavonoid that's gaining a lot of attention because people are utilizing it for its obvious antioxidant properties. But there's also some really interesting in vitro research that is indicating that quercetin might affect our immune system. It might affect our inflammatory response within our body. So I want to do a deep dive because the research is pretty conflicting. There's some reasons as to why it's conflicting, but the conflicting research also illuminates who might benefit from quercetin more so than perhaps another group, okay? So let's go ahead and dive in. So quercetin is literally just a pigment. It is what gives certain fruits and vegetables and foods a given color, okay? It's nothing extravagant. But in the world of flavonoids, there aren't a lot that really cast the potential impact that quercetin does. Now, normally I take the stance to say, okay, with antioxidants, you're best off to just take care of your body so that your body upregulates its own antioxidant production. Okay, by going and eating a big salad with a bunch of antioxidants, you're not absolving yourself of your duties to be healthy and to take care of yourself, right? Like, you still have to pay attention to exercise, all these other things. And especially in the world of supplements, I don't like relying on a supplement to do the antioxidant work for you. However, in the world of quercetin, I think it's a slightly different direction because it's really a whole different process. So quercetin has a very powerful scavenging ability, okay? It has a very powerful effect at going around through your body and potentially scavenging up what are called free radicals or reactive oxygen species. Now what's unique about quercetin is quercetin does neutralize these reactive oxygen species, these oxidative stressors, but when it neutralizes them, it reduces them and changes them to something called oquinone methide or quinone methide, which is actually toxic to the body. So when it affects them, it's making a toxic compound. So your body needs its own antioxidant processes like glutathione, superoxide dismutase, all that stuff to deal with it in the first place. It's almost like quercetin goes around and neutralizes these things and says, okay, I, I did the dirty work, now you come on and you actually clean this up. So if your immune system isn't actively working and your inflammatory response isn't actively working well to begin with, quercetin may not really help you all that much. At least that's what the data is starting to show. The way that it works is it enables expression of antioxidant enzymes, okay? And it does this through what is called the NRF2 pathway, okay? In this case, it is upregulating potentially the body's ability to scavenge as well. So let's go ahead and break down some of the research here, okay? First, when we look at the in vitro research surrounding the world of like the inflammatory response, it's pretty fascinating, but full disclaimer, this is in vitro research, which means it's done in cultured cells, in Petri dishes. Doesn't necessarily translate into humans. We'll get into the observational studies here in just a moment, but this is fascinating stuff nevertheless. In vitro, they're seeing that quercetin may actually inhibit what is called lipopolysaccharide-induced tumor necrosis factor alpha production. TNFA, or tumor necrosis factor alpha, that is an inflammatory cytokine that is associated with a lot of inflammatory responses, okay? It's something that we want to have, but we don't want to have too much of it. Lipopolysaccharides are pathogenic material that a lot of times cross out of our gut into our bloodstream, inducing inflammation. Now, this doesn't mean that quercetin is going to help you with a leaky gut, that's not what I'm suggesting. This is an in vitro study, which means they probably induced inflammation via lipopolysaccharides because it is such a method that we know to do so, right? Either way, very fascinating. They also found that quercetin affected what is called interleukin-8, which is an inflammatory cytokine, specifically in lung cells. This is why it's getting so much attention right now because in vitro, there is the potential to really help out in terms of lung defense, which is a big thing, of course. But then when you start looking observationally, it's a little bit more bleak. Now, additionally in vitro, they found that quercetin inhibits the production of what are called inflammatory enzymes. Okay, so cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase. Okay, these are like the enzymes that build inflammation, essentially. So again, in vitro, in petri dishes, like this is very fascinating, fascinating stuff. But now let's look at the data in humans because it's a little bit more confusing. There was a study that was published in the journal Pharmacology Research. It was a 12-week study, okay, and they gave subjects 500 to 1,000 milligrams of quercetin daily, okay? And they wanted to measure like their risk or their occurrence of upper respiratory tract infections. They found that there was no change in the occurrence of upper respiratory tract infections. Kind of interesting. But 
there was a subgroup within this entire study of people that were 40 or older that classified themselves as fit. Okay? They found that there was a 31% reduction in sick days in those fit people and a 36% reduction in upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. Okay. This is starting to tell us some more. And when we look through the rest of the research, I think we'll start to have somewhat of a hypothesis here. Then there was a study that was published in the British Journal Nutrition. This looked at female participants, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of quercetin once again for 12 weeks. They found that their plasma levels of quercetin did increase. They were absorbing quercetin, okay. But there was no change in their innate immune function. What this is potentially telling us here is that it didn't upregulate anything. It didn't change their inflammatory markers. It didn't downregulate tumor necrosis factor alpha. Nothing that we've seen in the in vitro studies. Okay. Well, then there was a study that was published in the journal Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. This one looked at 1,000 milligrams per day. Okay. Now, in trained athletes, so this is a little bit more interesting. What they found with this is that it didn't seem to alter the immune function. So once again, it didn't alter the immune function in the way that we've seen in like in vitro studies, right? It didn't. We didn't see the same thing happen. But what they did see is a significant reduction in the occurrence of upper respiratory tract infections. In this case, it went from nine out of 20 trained athletes developing an upper respiratory tract infection down to one out of 20. That is some pretty serious difference there. Now, athletes that are really stressing themselves aerobically, they are much more prone to upper respiratory tract infections. It happens a lot. Ultra runners, cyclists, things like that, they get upper respiratory tract infections because they're stressing those cells within their lungs a lot. But then there was another study published in the International Journal of Sports Medicine that took a look at athletes that were doing what is called the Western States, which if you're a runner, you know the Western States. It's an ultra marathon, uh, world famous, okay? They found that quercetin didn't really change things a whole lot for them. So, okay. What is going on here? Why is there such a discrepancy? Why is there such a big difference between all of these studies? Like, is quercetin good? Is it bad? What the heck? Well, when you start looking at more data, you realize that quercetin's been used to help mitigate the inflammatory response associated with different prostate conditions, so to reduce prostate inflammation. So with this, there's other data that we can look at. We found that there are these things called genetic polymorphisms that are probably affecting how individuals respond to quercetin. So what we've kind of determined here, and again, this is not like everything you need to take to the bank, this is what we're looking at with research, is that some people might respond really well to quercetin, some people might not at all. But most people that do potentially respond to quercetin are probably people that are stressing their bodies with aerobic work, or they are working out a lot, or they're just exercising a lot, and they're stressing that potential upper respiratory area to begin with. Very, very fascinating stuff. There's other stuff surrounding the heart and glucose and the brain, which I'm going to talk about here in just a second. I don't necessarily think that you need to go out and buy quercetin supplements. I honestly do not. I think maybe there's a use case if you are pushing it, but you can eat a lot more capers, which are the strongest, like highest potential source for quercetin, more in the way of red onions. Berries are huge, also asparagus, and if it's cooked, it activates the quercetin more. Another one that's really good is elderberry, which is popular right now anyway, like elderberry tea, things like that. All those things are rich in quercetin, and I think by adding those into your diet and sprinkling them in more, you're probably better off than mega dosing some kind of supplement that might cost a couple bucks more, who knows? So kind of having that diversity of food. I did put a link down below for Thrive Market. I do know through Thrive, some of these things are available, like there's freeze dried berries. I know they have these uh, little asparagus pouches. So like they're literally on the go asparagus pouches that are in like a marinade, and you can just rip them open and eat them on the go. Super, super convenient there. They have all kinds of elderberry extracts, they have elderberry teas, so all these things, that way you're not having to spend a bunch of money on supplements, rather spend money on food and do it right, but that's just my opinion. That link down below is for 40% off, so check them out down below. It's a Thrive Market link, so an online membership-based grocery store. That way you can do your shopping just like you're going to Whole Foods or anything like that, except you're doing it online, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep, so that way you can select the kinds of foods you want, select by keto, paleo, fasting, whatever it is you're doing. So any specific kinds of things you're looking for, you could just search, pops up, a bunch of different options, put it to your cart, then it shows up at your doorstep in a couple of days, easy peasy. Plus, again, you're saving 40% off your initial order and a free gift when you use that link down below. So check them out after this video. Okay, now we get into the nitty gritty, really cool stuff. Heart and cardiovascular effects. 
Again, we have to take things with a grain of salt, okay? It doesn't always mean that everything's going to work here. But there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrition that took a look at subjects that consumed 730 milligrams of quercetin, okay? And they did this for 28 days, and they found that there was a pretty decent drop in blood pressure. Well, this is kind of interesting. So didn't get into a whole lot of the mechanisms there, but then there was another study that was also published in the journal Nutrition that found that once again, they saw similar outcomes with people with very high blood pressure. And what this study ultimately gave us as far as information was that you potentially have to have pretty severe hypertension to have positive effects from quercetin as far as blood pressure goes. And even then, it's a little bit iffy. We have to be careful with how we talk about this, right? We can't take a disease state and say, this is absolutely going to fix the issue. But the more severe the issue is, perhaps that's where quercetin has an effect. So maybe it's such a minimal effect, it's only noticeable when you're at the extreme. However, when you look at the mechanisms of how reactive oxygen species work upon the vascular system and the cardiovascular system in the first place, it does kind of make sense. When you have a high level of reactive oxygen species or a high level of oxidative stress, what can happen is it can affect the vascular system. It can make it weaker. It can downregulate what's called nitric oxide synthase, which is what allows those vessels to be more flexible and stretchy. So by downregulating that, you are reducing the basically the pliability or the flexibility of the vascular system. But reactive oxygen species can also have an effect on increasing the level of hydrogen peroxide, which is stressful to the body. We don't want too much of it, right? So we're having these things that are impacting our vascular system. So when you have this kind of vascular dysfunction, think about it like this. Your arteries are more rigid, so therefore blood is having to, like, you know, you're creating more blood pressure, the heart's having to work harder, more cardiac stress, right? You factor this in with a lot of other things that can happen with high levels of reactive oxygen species, it starts to make a little bit of sense. Maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe quercetin, maybe, has an effect on our reactive oxygen species because it is powerful at scavenging those, and that is potentially helping our vascular system. Again, just looking at the data here. Now here's where it's really cool for metabolic health, but the research is still embryonic. We're looking at rodent model stuff. And just so you understand, if you're a veteran of this channel, you know, but if you're newer to the channel, rodent models are where things start. It goes from in vitro, look at cultured cells, then you look in rodents, and then you look in humans. Okay, very standard sort of progression. So when you start to see positive outcomes in rodents, you can start to get a little bit excited, but then you really have to wait to see what happens in humans because sometimes it doesn't pan out. But still, it's one of those things that's so easy to add to your diet, maybe this positive research that we're finding could be good. So what they found is that mice that were supplementing with quercetin had lower fasting glucose, lower levels of glucose in general, and lower HbA1c, their sort of long tail lagging indicator of high levels of glucose. Now what they're hypothesizing is that quercetin has an effect on carbohydrate absorption. Okay, it may act as what is called an alpha glucosidase inhibitor, which means it's affecting the enzymes that actually allow carbohydrates to absorb. So when these mice were eating carbohydrates and taking quercetin, they weren't absorbing as many of the carbohydrates. This is a very positive thing because it can affect and sort of attenuate the blood glucose response from a higher carbohydrate meal. They also found that it improved the insulin levels of diabetic mice. Now this could be working upon a different gene expression pathway. Okay, they found that it could be affecting genes that are in the pancreas and the liver that have to do with insulin secretion. In this case, we're talking about CDKN1A. If you're familiar with that in the pancreas and the liver, CDKN1A, has an effect on how insulin is secreted. So if we're manipulating that potentially with something that is affecting it, then we're affecting how insulin responds basically to glucose. So in this case, they're noticing high levels of glucose can be affected, but modest levels of glucose do not. So this gene expression kind of attribute of the pancreas and the liver affects an area that basically only affects insulin response to high levels of glucose. Now, that may sound kind of like random and like, why does that matter? Well, basically it means that in these mice, if they had a big spike, it was able to get responded to and attenuated and just mitigated faster. This is very good for people that are dealing with chronically high levels of blood glucose or huge spikes. Now, lastly, there's some interesting research starting to happen in terms of the brain. So because of all the reasons that I mentioned before, okay, in terms of how quercetin affects potentially 
the inflammatory response within the body and reactive oxygen species, of course, researchers are going to say, well, maybe quercetin can help scavenge free radicals within the brain. Well, we're starting to see some positive outcomes there, but again, it's way too early to tell. So at the end of the day, it really is one of those things where how hard is it to add some capers to your diet? How hard is it to add some elderberry tea? How hard is it to really add some asparagus now and then if you're really just trying to scavenge those free radicals as much as you can? So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. If you're working out extra hard, then my honest opinion is that quercetin probably works well for you. See you tomorrow.